Okay, so let's um, conclude this brief three lecture set of lectures um, with uh, the final three parts of this chapter. Luckily, this is going to be way shorter than that last one, uh, which is very uh, detail oriented. So we're just going to kind of finish by talking about some, um, up until now, right, we've talked about transcription factors and how they can recruit different proteins and protein complexes to genes to upregulate them or downregulate them in various ways. Um, so to end this short series, we're going to talk about some direct covalent modifications to DNA and how that can affect gene expression. Um, and then we're going to talk about insulators briefly. And finally, just one slide um, on the ENCODE project, which is a, a project that's been ongoing now for many, many years, well, maybe less than a decade, probably, um, to try and untangle some of this mess of gene regulation in eukaryotes. Um, so let's begin uh, this final lecture by talking about DNA methylation. Um, and this is basically a change in chromatin structure, but this time we're talking about uh, direct methylation or covalent modification, specifically methylation, of um, the DNA itself. Um, and this is performed by uh, an enzyme called DNA methyltransferase because it transfers methyl groups to DNA. Um, DNA methylation is, is common to some eukaryotic species, but, but not all. Um, yeast, so a very simple eukaryote, and Drosophila, a more complex eukaryote, have little DNA methylation, whereas um, vertebrates, so anything with a backbone, higher eukaryotes, um, as they are sometimes thought of. And plants, interestingly, have a lot of DNA methylation. Um, in mammals, such as us, about five-ish percent of your DNA uh, is methylated. And methylation is kind of interesting because your DNA can be, um, be present in several forms of methylation. So they're shown at the bottom of this slide. In the middle, we see a double-stranded piece of DNA, um, which is unmethylated. And what you're shown here is the double-stranded piece of DNA. Um, there's a CG base pair. Um, there's actually two of them that are shown, and there are three little uh, hydrogen bonds are presented as three little dots. Cytosine, the C um, base of DNA, uh, is known to be methylated. And you can get two, three different situations in your DNA. Um, one is where it's completely unmethylated. That's the one at the top. On the left is shown a hemimethylated piece of DNA. Um, that's where half of it is methylated. In other words, one strand has a C that is methylated and a methyl group um, is CH3, as shown down here. Uh, on the right hand side, there is a fully methylated piece of double-stranded DNA where both cytogenes are methylated. Um, and, and at least in the terms of direct methylation of DNA itself, the DNA molecule, we're not talking about methylation of histones, um, it is generally correlated with um, inhibition of transcription. Um, now, there are certain parts of your genome um, and plant genomes and genomes of other vertebrates that have these things called CPG islands in them. And basically what that means is it's a long stretch of DNA that's made of Cs and Gs. Therefore, a lot of cytosines, right? And this tends to happen near promoters. Now, if you methylate these CPG islands, it tends to shut down transcription of whatever gene they're close to. So if you're a housekeeping gene, and remember, housekeeping genes are genes that are required to be on in every cell all of the time. That's why they're called housekeeping genes. Uh, these CPG islands tend to be unmethylated because methylation is associated with repression. You don't want to repress a housekeeping gene. 
Um, and these genes are on in, in most cells. But in tissue specific genes, so for example, if you're a muscle cell, you have the same housekeeping genes as a nerve cell, but you have a bunch of muscle specific, in other words, tissue specific genes that are turned on. Um, in tissue specific genes, you can actually silence expression of a gene by methylating the CPG islands. So if you think about tissue specificity in gene expression, right? A muscle cell is going to methylate the CPG island of a gene that's required in nerve cells, for example. So it's shut down in that particular cell because it's a muscle cell, doesn't need a nerve specific gene to be expressed. Um, it's thought that methylation of DNA is recruited with um, repression because it affects the chromatid structure, as I mentioned earlier. And it's thought that basically it recruits factors that lead to more chromatin compaction, burying the gene away in chromatin and making it inaccessible to transcription factors and RNA polymerase and all that stuff. So um, essentially, there are a few different ways that methylation of DNA can affect transcription. Um, on the top here is an example of DNA shown in blue, um, a CPG island shown here next to the core promoter of a gene. Here's the coding sequence of that gene that will need to be transcribed if that gene is to be expressed. Um, and here's an activator protein, transcription factor, binding to this enhancer sequence. Now, if the CPG island becomes methylated, that actually, is, in this case, is blocking the recruitment of this transcription factor to the enhancer, and that can shut down the gene in question. Um, interestingly, um, DNA methylation is thought to be heritable. Now, this is an example of um, what is called um, epigenetic inheritance, which is just inheritance that is not within DNA sequence itself, once thought to be impossible. Uh, it was thought that all of um, heritability came from DNA sequence, but we now know that's not true. Um, and one of the ways that you can pass on a trait to the next generation without changing the DNA sequence is that methylation can be passed on to the next generation um, of DNA, that is. Um, this might explain something called, or this helps to explain something called genomic imprinting, which was the observation that certain genes are shut down in a parent and that gene is also shut down in um, the offspring. And now we know that that's at least partially due to some genes being methylated in the parent. And then when the DNA is passed on to the next generation, those same genes are still methylated, uh, shutting them down in the, um, in the offspring. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about um, insulators. Well, actually not last but not least. This is the last sort of mechanistic thing we're going to talk about. Um, so I've already told you that enhancers can work at a distance from um, the promoter of the gene that they are regulating. That is true. So one of the questions that people had was, well, how does an enhancer know what gene to regulate, quote unquote? Um, and Part of that is explained by insulators. So what insulators are, are sequences of G DNA that essentially do just that. They insulate a gene from some regulatory effect um, that is close to them, where it's not meant to act on the gene itself. So if you have a gene and kind of close to that gene is an enhancer that acts on another gene, why doesn't the enhancer act on the gene that it is close to? Because of insulators. So insulators can act as a barrier to chromatin remodeling and others simply block the effects of enhancers. So how, how does that work? 
So here's an, uh, an incidence of an insulator acting as a barrier to chromatin remodeling. So here are two insulators shown in pink along this blue section of DNA. And what you can see is that in between those two insulators, there is a stretch of DNA that is acetylated. That is um, a chromatin mark that is highly correlated with gene activation. So what is to stop this acetylation kind of spreading down the DNA molecule? Well, insulators can stop it. And the way that they do it is, again, like kind of everything is done in the world of DNA, which is proteins bind to insulators in a sequence specific manner and can block the spread of chromatin modifications such as acetylation. So you can see how the non-acetylated non DNA is outside of those two insulators and within them it is acetylated. Um, here is an example of two genes, gene A and gene B. Um, and there's an enhancer in between those two genes. So here's the enhancer right here. And scientists have found um, instances where an insulator, shown as this pink piece of DNA, uh, recruits a protein to its specific sequence, and that blocks the effect of this enhancer on gene B whilst allowing it to act on gene A because there's no insulator between the enhancer and gene A. So this just gives you some idea of how you can sort of selectively insulate one gene from the regulatory elements that are controlling a second gene nearby. Okay, let's talk about the ENCODE project um, lastly. So as you now I'm sure are thinking, oh my goodness, this is complicated, and you would be 100% correct. Um, again, though, anchor your thinking in concepts, right? So concepts in transcriptional regulation in eukaryotes um, are very similar to those that you see in prokaryotes. DNA binding proteins, transcription factors, bind to specific DNA sequences, and then influence in lots of different ways um, target genes. Um, the ENCODE project um, was started about, I don't know, it's about a decade ago by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and ENCODE is an acronym which stands for the Ency Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE. And the goal of the ENCODE project is essentially to figure out how genes are regulated. So the idea is that um, they're gonna try and identify the functional elements of the human genome um, that are not uh, protein coding regions. That includes identifying transcription factor binding sites, figure out where DNA is methylated, identify which histones bind where and how are they modified, map DNA one, uh, DNA's one cleavage sites that actually refers to so you can uh, you can basically take chromatin and digest it with an enzyme called DNase which cuts DNA but it will only cut DNA where there's no nucleosomes so a DNA cleavage site is a nucleosome free region um, isolated and sequence RNA from humans to figure out is it really true that only protein coding sequences are transcribed Spoiler alert, it is not true. Lots of the genome is transcribed and we're not quite sure why. Um, but this gives you some idea, right? So we talked very early on in this class about how 98% of the human genome is not protein coding genes. And we're not, and I said we're not sure what a lot of it does, and that's true. But what you can see from this section on regulation of gene transcription is that there is a certain percentage of the human genome that is transcription factor binding sites and things like that. Um, and really, we're only just starting to figure that stuff out because it is phenomenally complicated um, and difficult to uh, untie. So that's the end of this section. That second lecture was by far the most complicated. 
Uh, don't worry about the chromatin immunoprecipitation part. Uh, we're not really going to talk about that in this class. Um, and don't worry about the very last section of the chapter um, either. So um, 15.6, I think. All right, guys, um, I uh, will see you again soon. Enjoy. Bye.